Welcome back to the GCN Racing News Show. This week, the World Championships have started and there's already been a huge upset. I'll be wrapping up the men's and women's individual time trials, as well as the tours of Luxembourg and Slovakia and a whole host of one-day semi-classics. <laughs> But I will start in Wollongong, Australia, where the first medals and rainbow jerseys were awarded yesterday in the men's and women's elite time trials. In the men's race, Filippo Ganna set off last as the two-time defending champion, but it was almost immediately clear he wasn't on the kind of form that we expect from him and he expects from himself. Three seconds off the best at the first time check, but then already 45 seconds off the pace at the second. There was no coming back for the Italian, he'd eventually finish a very disappointing seventh place. Second favourite on the day, Remco Avenepoel, was looking better than Ganna, but he was not the same Avenepoel that we saw annihilate the field at the Vuelta Espana time trial. He went from second to third between the first two time checks, and that was where he would stay right the way to the finish line. Now, the man who was setting all the best times en route at the intermediate checks was Switzerland's Stefan Kung. 24.5 kilometres into the 34k test, he was 12 seconds clear of everybody else, and we were all thinking the same thing. Finally, Stefan Kung is going to hit the nail on the head at one of the biggest races in the world. But it wasn't to be. He didn't explode, but he cracked just enough in those final few kilometres that he lost those 12 seconds advantage, plus three more. Who to? Tobias Foss of Norway, the first Norwegian to have even medalled at this particular event, let alone won it. Fourth at the first time check, second at the second, but first where it mattered. Now, Foss is definitely not a name that many people would have had on their list of potential winners before the start of the event, and for good reason. Until yesterday, Foss hadn't won a single pro race outside of the Norwegian National Championships. Now, he's always been very consistent in his time, Charlie. He's had four top tens at the Giro d'Italia, for example, over the last couple of seasons, but he's not a prolific winner. Even when I look back to his results in UCI-ranked races as a junior and under 23, he didn't win one. So there's no doubt it was a huge upset and a big surprise, as much for Foss himself as for the rest of us. And I just loved watching his disbelief, sitting in the hot seat, watching favourite after favourite cross the finish line outside the time that he set. And what a feeling that must have been. Kung, Evenepoel, Ganna, even with all the preparation that Foss had clearly put into this event, he couldn't have imagined he'd better those sorts of names even in his wildest dreams. But the best man won on the day, and he uploaded his file to Strava, complete with power. So for those of you interested in that data, he averaged 416 watts for his 40-minute effort with an average speed of 50.5 kilometers per hour. But the only number that really matters is the number one next to his name on the results sheet. He will now get to wear the rainbow jersey with pride in all individual time trials over the next 12 months. However pleased you are for Foss though, you have got to feel heartbroken for Stefan Kung. When is that guy going to pick up a big one? He's finished in the top five in 27 of the last 33 individual time trials that he started. And whilst he's won nine of those, including two European championships, he always seemed to fall just short at the biggest events. Second to Bogaccia at the Tour de France last year in an individual time trial, fractions of a second away from a medal at the Olympic Games, a single second off the win at the European Championships this year, and now three seconds short of becoming world champion. I'll tell you what, when Stefan Kung does win at a really major championship or a big classic, I'm going to be jumping for joy. He really deserves to achieve that. In the women's event, the Dutch started as the big favourites, as they always seem to. Uh, they filled two of the top three positions for the last five editions of the World Time Trial Championships, but they didn't manage that this time around. However, they did take the most important step of the podium with the increasingly consistent and impressive Ellen van Dijk. The defending champion set off last, and it was immediately clear that barring any incident or accident, everybody else would be fighting for second place on the day. Nine seconds up at the first time check, 22 at the second, and she safely brought it home to retain her rainbow bands. Now, I hope for her, there are a few more individual time trials to show off those rainbow bands next year. She's only had three opportunities throughout 2022. 
Now, the rider who pushed her closest on the day was the Australian Grace Brown. Uh, she won her national championships in January, but hasn't had a single opportunity this year to show off the green and gold stripes. Now, it was a brilliant ride, you've got to say, by Grace Brown, who actually rode the final part of the course nine seconds quicker than that of Ellen van Dyke, crossing the line 13 seconds shy of the Dutch woman. Marla Rusa of Switzerland was consistent throughout the time trial and claimed the bronze medal on the day. The under-23 title went to a rider who finished fourth on the day, Vittoria Guazzini of Italy. Uh, the 21-year-old was just 12 seconds slower than Rusa on the day. Americans Leah Thomas and Kristen Faulkner finished fifth and sixth respectively. But the big surprise of the day was Annemiek van Fleurten only managing seventh. That's the worst result she'd ever had in the World Time Trial Championships. Anemic batteries. How was this TT for you? Uh, shit. <laughs> uh, I couldn't push the power I wanted to push, so uh, I underperformed today uh, with my power. Um, yeah, that's sometimes time trial. You don't have your day, and then it's a long day uh, out there. 34 kilometers uh, already suffering, but if you don't believe that you have the reward in the end, it uh, will become even harder. What do you need to do this week to be ready for Saturday? Um, recover. And I also do the team relay, so uh, there's not much time to get bored. Uh, we recover, we go to the team relay, we recover and uh, we race on Saturday. Uh, now to what's coming up on GCN Plus over the next seven days. And much of it revolves around the continued World Championships in Australia. By the time this show is released, the men's under-23 individual time trial will be done and dusted. And then tonight, or the early hours of tomorrow morning, European time, it's the junior men's and women's. And then 24 hours later, we've got the mixed relay. Uh, that will bring the time trialling to an end ahead of a rest day on Thursday. And then from Friday, it's the road races. Uh, we've got the junior and under-23 men's that day, the junior and elite women's on Saturday, within which we'll have the rather controversial under-23 women's ties decided. And then the men's road race is on Sunday. Uh, now, our rights for the World Championships are reasonably restricted, but if you're in Europe, excluding Denmark, Norway, Sweden and Italy, you'll be able to tune in for the live coverage and a post-race breakaway show after the women's and men's elite road races. Uh, if you need, incidentally, to find out the times of each one in your local area, check the app, because we've got them all there. Uh, stay tuned as well for our big GCN preview of the elite road races, which we hope to have out for you on Wednesday on GCN Racing. Uh, we've also got another big weekend of cyclocross coming up. The USCX moves to Rochester for rounds three and four of the series, whilst the exact cross heads to Beringen for round two. Uh, the only restriction on that coverage is that we're unable to broadcast the exact cross races in Belgium, but you can watch it from all other territories around the world. In other races, Matthias Skelmosser of Trek Segafredo took his first and second wins as a pro rider in the space of just a couple of days at the Tour of Luxembourg. The Danish rider has been knocking on the door since the season's start. Uh, his first as a pro with 22 top 10 finishes before his win in the time trial on Friday. Second on the fifth and final stage was enough for him to take the general classification by five seconds over fellow 21-year-old Kevin Vakalin of Arkea Samsig. Uh, that final day marked the second stage win of the week for Valentin Madawas of Groupama FDJ, who also won on the opening day. Both short, sharp uphill finishes, which Madouas has been performing particularly well on this year, including, of course, at the Cobble Classics earlier this spring. Uh, his undoing, though, was the time trial in which he conceded 39 seconds to Skilmosser. Uh, the other two stages were won by Aaron Gate, who definitely deserves a spot in a World Tour team, and Matteo Trentin, who also won the points classification overall. Uh, one classification, though, that I've not heard of before was that of friendliest rider of the race. So, chapeau Colin Heiderscheid. I like that award, I've got to say, friendliest rider. In Slovakia, the first two stages were both won by Quickstep Alpha Vinyl's Ethan Vernon. The first of those being a short prologue and the second a sprint finish. Uh, on stage three, we had the first pro win for a rider who's not even a fully-fledged pro yet. Ireland's Archie Ryan, who recently finished just off the podium at the Tour de l'Avenir, won the uphill finish against some notable names, Mary Van Sevenance and Lorenzo Fortunato. Uh, Ryan was at the race competing with Jumbo Visma, with whom he signed a contract for the next few years. The leader on the GC at the end of that day, though, was the Czech rider Joseph Czerny of Quickstep Alpha Vinyl, who defended that lead through to the end of the race, his first overall victory in a stage race since the Czech cycling tour five years ago. 
Uh, stage four was won by Kuhn Bauman of Jumbo Visma, who timed his move perfectly out of the final corner, whilst the breakaway got the better of the bunch on Saturday's final stage. Uh, the Volker Vessel cycling duo of Peter Shelting and Jasper Haste left their other breakaway companions behind in the closing stages and then kept the bunch at bay by 13 seconds. How do you decide who wins when you're away with a teammate? Well, there seems to be a new tradition in the sport of cycling. I think uh, we went full gas until the last uh, 500 meters and uh, he was like, oh, I, I really want to win. And I was like, oh, mate, me too. So uh, I said, we should do uh, rock, paper, scissor, and uh, yeah, I won, so uh, <laughs> really lucky today. <laughs> so, kids, if you want to be a successful pro rider in the future, train hard on your bike, but also work hard on your rock, paper, scissors game, because that might win you a few races. And how good was Haas' reaction in that interview? I absolutely love seeing an underdog taking the spoils against World Tour competition. He was just so happy, wasn't he? Well done to you, Jasper. Uh, on to all of the one-day races from last week now. Uh, Mark here, she continues to blow either very hot or very cold. He won the Giro della Toscana on Wednesday, whilst the man who finished third that day went two better the next. Uh, Danny Martinez was the winner of the Coppa Sabatini. Up in Belgium, Mathieu van der Poel underlined his status as one of the big favourites for the World Championships by winning the hilltop sprint at the end of the Tour de Wallonie. Uh, he got the better of Binyam Gomai and Gonzalo Serrano there, and he's now won his last three races on the trot. Thursday's Championships of Flanders finished in a big bunch sprint, and threading through everybody like a needle was European champion Fabio Jakobsen of Quickstep Alpha Vinyl. And when asked by his swan year at the finish whether he'd won or not, he replied by saying, of course. Sounds easy, doesn't it? But when you see that Caleb Ewan was second and Dilla Grunewagen was third, it must have been anything but. And finally, on the roadside at least, at the Primus Classic on Saturday, uh, Jordi Meas outsprinted Demar and Kant to the line to take his second win in the space of just 10 days. His prize? A beer on the podium. Cheers. Oh my God, he's not going for the entire. That's like half a litre. Oh my. No, nah, he's going for half a bit. Ah, he failed. <laughs> But still, that is a decent, decent, decent glass of beer. Uh, well, amazed. I hope he doesn't have to drive home. He'll probably take the team bus. Now, I thought that was a pretty good effort from Mayers, uh, but Thomas de Ghent disagreed with me, describing his effort as weak. It's all relative, Thomas. It's all relative. On to cyclocross now, and it already felt like we were in the middle of winter yesterday when I watched the opening round of the exact cross series in Krubecker. Uh, the conditions started off reasonably well for the women's race, but then the heavens opened towards the end of their race and it made it complete mud bath for the men's, which came a little bit later. Cyclocross is definitely back. Uh, in the women's race, guess what? The Dutch filled all of the podium spots. Uh, Denise Betzema in third place on the day, Amory Vorst in second, but head and shoulders above everybody else, the former U23 world champion Femke van Empel, who is still just 20 years of age. Her winning margin in the end was 1 minute and 11 seconds, and if that performance was anything to go by, she's made another step up in the off-season. In the men's race, Michael van Turenhout got off to the perfect season start. Uh, four riders separated themselves from the rest in the early stages of the mud bar, but Van Turenhout proved the strongest of that quartet. It was his teammate Ely Isabit who finished 22 seconds back in second place, with Lon Swake a further 11 seconds back in third. Meanwhile, in the USA, the second USCX series kicked off on Saturday in Roanoke, Virginia, where conditions couldn't really have been much different to those in Belgium. And unfortunately for the local American riders, they were beaten in both the men's and the women's races. Uh, Caroline Manny of Alpha Groove Silverthorne opened up a gap on the rest after about a quarter of an hour racing in the women's race, never to be seen again. Second place on the day was Raylan Nuss, who only started racing in 2017, with Austin Killips in third. In the men's race, Vincent Bastans, the man who came, saw and conquered the first four rounds of this series last year, resumed just as he'd left off. Eric Brunner, who won the penultimate round of the series last year, tried his best to distance the Belgium over the last lap of the race, but when Bastans kicked with just a few hundred metres remaining, the uh, American rider had no answer. Curtis White took third place on the day. 
Uh, by the time this show is out again, the second round of that series will be done, and judging by the current weather conditions over there, literally dusted as well. If you didn't see it, don't forget that you can catch up with all the action on demand on GCN+. Uh, in other news, Tanya Erat announced that she will retire from the sport at the end of this season. Erat won the second edition of the Zwift Academy back in 2017, earning herself a contract with Canyon SRAM, with whom she stayed until the start of 2021. Uh, for the last two seasons, she's been with Tibco and the team that morphed into EF, uh, but there was a long road to recovery for her at the end of last year after a serious crash in the women's tour left her needing spinal surgery. Uh, in her Instagram post last week, she said, it's not a goodbye, it's just a see you someplace else. Uh, we wish you all the best in whatever comes next, Tanya. Uh, back to the World Championships now, and two bits of contradictory news seem to surface at almost exactly the same time last week. The first part is that the prize money at the World Championships is going to be equally split between men and women, whilst the second part was that the French Federation had chosen to fly their elite male riders to Australia in business class whilst their female counterparts were back in economy. Uh, now, after being quizzed about the decision, uh, the Federation said it was because the men are heading there to defend a title and that the perceived chance of them bringing back a medal is far higher than that of the women's French team. Uh, one of the higher profile French women who didn't fly at all to Australia is Audrey Cordon Rago. Uh, she took to social media over the weekend to explain that her non participation is because she suffered a stroke just over one week ago. Now, that must have come obviously as an awful shock to her. So, we send our very best wishes to Audrey and hope that you get well soon. Meanwhile, Jonas Vinigal has confirmed that he will return to competition in the not too distant future and for the first time since the Tour de France at the Crow Race. Uh, that's from the 27th of September to the 2nd of October. He will then compete at the fifth and final monument of the year, Il Lombardia. And it's going to be interesting to see how his form is, isn't it? I don't think any of us would begrudge him if he's been relaxing and enjoying his Tour de France success, but at the same time, it would be great to see him competitive at the end of this season. I shall finish with some transfer news and rumours. Uh, Tymon Allensman is now confirmed as going to the Ineos Grenadiers from Team DSM next season, something I thought that had already been announced quite some time ago, in fact. Uh, the rumours have mainly been coming from Daniel Benson of Velo News, who always seems to be on the money when it comes to rider transfer rumours. Uh, the first of those is that Adam Yates, currently with Ineos Grenadiers, is in talks with UAE team Emirates, which could further strengthen their Grand Tour roster. And the second is that Zdenek Stibar, who wasn't offered a contract renewal at the quick step after 12 years with the squad, is heading to team bike exchange Jayco. At 36 years of age, it's likely Steve is a little past his best physically, but he'd certainly bring a wealth of experience to that team. Right, that wraps up the GCN Racing News for another week. I'll be back again this time next week to wrap up the World Championships from Australia. See you then.